what connection does John Locke have to meditation? John Locke wrote in his essay on the human understanding that the sounds we make and the words we use in philosophical discourse should correspond to clear and distinct ideas. For example, the word triangle in the English language corresponds to the object that looks somewhat like this when you draw it on paper, other mathematical definitions aside. However, in the case when we meditate, we chant sounds, um, or otherwise, unbound from clear and distinct ideas to avoid thinking and imagining, generally, in order to clear the mind. Introduction over. So I see in John Locke a recommendation of the of one mental operation, a strict binding of sounds, syllables, to clear and distinct ideas, whether you visualize them or really fix their definitions for a discourse. And of course, also, also the discarding of terms that you don't really know that well, and you're just aping as a disciple of an ideology, for example. You want to reject those and prune those sounds, words in your discourse. <laughs> Now, in the case of meditation, you want to fixate on a few sounds as well, I suppose, but to the extent you can, unbind them from actual things, scenes, persons, and so on, so you can just repeat them to liberate your mind, either from all clear and distinct ideas, or from a bad subset of however clear and distinct ideas that nonetheless unduly influence your thought. Maybe you want to avoid pseudomorphosis, that is the morphing of a new cultural trend that Spengler speaks about. Metaphorically, it's simply pavement that perturbs or mm, badly affects the growing of grass or other herbs, greenery. That is the basic contrast uh, um, between John Locke's recommendation and whatever is recommended by those who practice meditation, to the extent those who meditate truly recommend or exhort. That would be a bit too strong. Now that aside, I do have some notes here. Maybe some of them are worth reading and may comment on some of the things I've said already. But because this video is just experimental, you're free to go if you haven't already bounced in the first 13 or 19 seconds. For those who want to stay, I do want to patiently go over some of these blocks to see if there's a contradiction or anyway. So Locke's, it says here, Locke's recommendation. What is it? Locke says sounds should map to clear and distinct ideas. What's an idea? This is something we can add to the former discourse. Mainly an intellectual object. It's, hmm, as I said, like a triangle or a circle. Geometry furnishes us with a pretty, pretty good store of examples. But mental operations, too, serve as clear and distinct ideas. Reflection, remembering, and and the likewise. But in this case, when I say binding to binding sounds to ideas or sense to something rational, that's also a mental operation, which I hope is a sufficiently clear and distinct idea, even if it's not seen like uh, this, what is this? Um, I get a bottle or some store of vitamin D capsules important in the winter. Now, the opposite, anyway, idea, mental operation, would be unbinding. We want to make sure that the sound we say when we meditate, we want to generally mm, clear the mind. What does that mean? I want to put myself in a state where the previously most pressing questions, is she going to call me back? 
for example, uh, those most pressing questions are drained. And the only questions we have are either none, which is great, or those which we've been um, preoccupied with, but in a weak way over the past you know, 30, 20 years of our lives. These are philosophical questions that come to mind to which we can allocate attention. We're not perturbed by By what? By things that can that concern you know, career, work, yeah, you know, relationships, especially sexual, and and so on. Those things that detract us from a true herbalism that I want to say, which negatively defined as an opposite of um of, of servitude to the employer or servitude towards you know, the woman with whom or the woman with whom you're involved. And I guess what people call, well, negative adjective here, relationships. This is just an example. Yeah, so, so I hate that. I think we have an idea of what is an idea. It's like it's like an object. An idea could be this um, this cup in which I have espresso. An idea could also be coffee or espresso. The idea is the mind's object, which maps almost across the given spatial distance to the thing itself. Like, I have an idea of a jar, and here, here's a jar. I have an idea of water, and here's the actual water. So sugar, um, not only a clear and distinct idea, but sweetness is also a clear and distinct idea, as anyone could experience the sweetness of the sugar on his tongue, or the bitterness of the espresso, the coffee. So these ideas of sense, um, I guess, are adequate by their very by their very nature. It's hard to be mistaken by the sense, and except in the case of illusions, especially not only the typical optical illusions of the moon's closer than it actually is to the pressure or at atmosphere, how the air is today or tonight, but also let's consider auditory illusions. When you're doing transcription, dictation exercises, learning a foreign language, I at least totally mishear not just vowels, but consonants, whole words, and so on. Why is that? It's a topic for another video, but auditory illusion and gradually correcting it, tightening it, just like a bad set of adult teeth, a bad smile can be corrected over nine to 12 months with Invisalign. No, that's not an ad. It's just an analogy. Right, so for example, a record in a database might correspond to your order of a sleeve of espresso capsules from amazon.com. So this order in Amazon's database would have to be a clear and distinct idea that maps to an actual request. So it's not a shape like a triangle, it, it's something you've done and it's not just a thing you've asked for. It it's, it actually maps to an action or an event. So when did it happen? Uh, for whom? For you, perhaps? Uh, from where? What's your address? How much did you pay? Payment method? And all, all those things that have to do with the order would have to be cl um, very clearly appended, like the accidents to a substance. We know exactly what this order contains. So finally, ideas are more important than sounds in that Words for the same idea are going to vary across multiple, are multiple across multiple languages. So in French, as Locke says, John Locke, Dieu means God, but also in English, God refers to God. English now serving as a common currency, a kind of lingua franca to which other languages reduce. And you could argue that, okay, well, in Latin, Deus, without further qualification, in or of, with whatever preposition you want to use, in a culture of monotheism implies the single god, in which case a single member in the concept are kind of the same. The, the category and the member kind of blur, blur in, in, into one.
but perhaps we could achieve some thinking independent of natural language, tongues, nations, and so on, and, and directly, inter directly, I guess, intercourse, uh, rational mind to rational mind. And I think mathematics is that hope, if not the fulfillment of that hope. Uh, it's, of course, a kind of liberal world vision. Uh, war, war is not war, and conflict are not going to let us agree as much as possible, and so only speak the language of rational calculation with each other, so we can come together and achieve, you know, medicine, science for the greatest number. And maybe just to add something, because we're already over time anyway. This is the extra, the filler, the practice speaking part of the video. Uh, science invoked singularly is also part of that liberal hope, that kind of neutral antithesis to the Hobbesian state of nature. I'm improvising based on what I've heard about Hobbes, liberalism, Strauss. And you could go further with that, of course, but science, contrary to the, to the recommendation of John Locke for the science of the sound as a word, it's become mostly an empty thud that is a threat, refers more so to what you should do or shouldn't do in correspondence to a dominant ideology of whatever, whatever is the dominant regime. At this point in time, in this country, wherever I am, at least that was the case, um, you know, two or three years ago. Well, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see what unfolds in the near in the near future. But yeah, uh, even science itself as a term could be very detached from any clear and distinct idea and, and thus be abused, ab abused, uh, facilitate the abuse of power for people who really associate it with a clear and distinct idea, something something good. And then, but they can be used, they can be abused in order to do things or comply with things that are that are bad or not really that do not really facilitate a what a good, useful, and productive life at all. So does that cast a shadow of doubt on meditation, on the deliberate unbinding of sounds from clear and distinct ideas? Maybe. But the um, I'd argue the purpose of meditation isn't the abuse of masses. It's not the attempt to cause a human bison stampede in this direction or that direction, part of the great migrations of history, and again, invoked singularly. Why? Because history could vary across peoples, individuals, nations, ideologies, and, 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 and so on. So I have to be, I have to be careful. I have to be careful about that. I have to be careful that we're not invoking history as pseudo, pseudo atheists who think they've overcome monotheism, but have really just displaced the monism from the concept God into another. The same problem occurs when we or artists invoke art singularly as something that can't be called at the question becomes a kind of dogma, if not a singular motive of oh, perhaps self-sacrifice, et cetera, et cetera. There's so many, so many branches in this tree that we could just go down and um, climb up, stare, stare at the leaves and, and so on. Let's, let's just get back to this. So why not merely shout sounds? Uh, merely making sounds is just a way to command people to do something in accord with an ideology for war, for example or, um, you know, for politics, you know, internal politics, not necessarily with guns, but with votes or, or other coercion, like uh, employer-employee coercion, but does not evince clear and distinct ideas that can lead to knowledge and its increase. And a kind of Lockean metaphor, as a merchant would take a true store of his wealth, what he really has, and from there plan to increase it. So John Locke does not advocate Simply, oh, let's in just increase human knowledge. Let's first realize how little, if any, that we actually have. Again, we being, in this case, tr truly liberal and rational 
thinkers who want some neutral state of peace and cooperation, contrary to a Hobbesian state of nature, which is a war of prince against prince, principality versus principality, city versus city, and so on. How is meditation different from Locke's advice? I think we've been over this. So we want to unbind a syllable. It could be om, or it could be something that is your secret sauce. You know, don't, don't, um, I know I want you to leave comments down below, but do not expose your secret sounds or your syllables that you say when you meditate in the comments, of course. And yeah, as um, Ray Dalio has said, you go in, into the void, you divorce yourself from seeming awesome ideas that arise from your unconscious mind. Now, do you always do that? And this is my amateur opinion on meditation. That is to the question, is, is it really the case that no, no visualization is allowed when you're meditating? Uh, personally, I, I do on occasion visualize transitions like flushing toilets. Could be even, yes, elimination of waste, which on the one hand, oh, that's disgusting that you don't want to be affected by that. Uh, sure, but it's about the, um, the movement of, of the water. And yeah, so our peaceful stasis of water in a cup or just in a jar. It's unperturbed by what you cared about five minutes ago. Uh, sink straining or the or the uh, drain in, in a shower, sometimes untied shoes, the shoelaces untied, unbound, empty bags, as though to be used or retreating from their former use, so that we can imagine new uses of these things, which were once tools, but maybe can simply be, as though items in a still life, for example. So that said, visualization, when meditating, um, it could be okay if the, if the image corresponds really to a scene, a kind of transition, a kind of, a kind of unbinding, even if we ironically bind the operation unbinding to certain images, but be flexible, be flexible and and these, of course, uh, and and again, I think the main thing is to chant silently to yourself a sound that um, just takes you to your breath, your heartbeat. But 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 summary: meditation performs the opposite mental operation to that recommended by John Locke. John Locke recommends a binding of sound or sense to intellectual or rational objects, these ideas. Plain English, that might mean at the head of your discourse, defining your key terms, terms that you use frequently, for example, and making sure that in order to make sure, really, that the definition doesn't secretly change from paragraph to paragraph, which would... I think, occlude your argument. It might let you win an argument against an adversary who isn't, doesn't carefully track your multiple distinct uses of the same word, but both the two or three uses, none of which is, is, clearly, is clearly defined. In, in that regard, words can be used to dispute, to overpower an adversary, but does that victory really lead to an increase of human knowledge or just the silencing of a well-meaning doubter who isn't re really well-versed in your system. And we can talk about Aristotle and the Aristotelians, for that matter. So, ah, I did it again. John Locke recommends a binding of word to idea. What is an idea? We've been over that. Meditation seems to recommend the opposite, uh, almost an aggressive unbinding of words from ideas to involve ourselves and occupy ourselves with pure sounds to just turn off 
not only the rational mind, but also the worried mind that can foresee falsely and then can misjudge what is the case, how we stand to others, or how things will unfold. The markets are going to crash. My wife's going to divorce me. All, all these worries. Uh, where is my child right now? I'm not in that phase of life, as you already know, but I'm trying to put this all put this all together to argue that meditation has some place among our alongside our atomic habits. Uh, who demanded that the words thinkers use repeatedly not only be well defined but be bound, mapped to or be bound to clear and distinct ideas, independent of natural language, such as a triangle, which you can rationally see. So sounds that map to no clear and distinct ideas should be discarded. Only those words closely bound to ideas apprehended by reason should be used in a discourse that pretends unto philosophy. Otherwise, what? Then it's just um, an attempt to command yourself or command others to, um, you know, to do something or to, to regard you in a way that's false. Meditation, on the other hand, wants, insofar as it wants, you know, to use repeated meaningless sounds. Well, they're meaningless. Oh, it's meaningless. Well, yes. If if by meaningless we mean it refers to to what? Ohm refers to no clear and distinct idea. Howsoever, howsoever deliberately, it refers to nothing that that means that it means it means nothing it, it means nothing but it frees us from perhaps um i'm not sure what to say but repeated habitual thinking that actually uh, constrains our action you could say well, overthinking as opposed to doing yeah so now read this Meditation, on the other hand, wants to use repeated meaningless sounds. Meaningless, they refer to to nothing, to no idea, which is which is deliberate. Action can rise above knowing and thinking again, make knowing its mere auxiliary as it arrays its uniform and takes the field to make battle. Why? For no idea may be the idea of all ideas. And what means action invoked singularly, just like that. 